quick review of the atomic model. Dalton is giving the title The Father of the Modern Atom. He was born in the 1700s and he noticed that if you took something like water, a hydrogen-oxygen compound, and split it into its parts, hydrogen and oxygen, you would always get the same proportion of hydrogen to oxygen, in this case 2 to 1. He called this general observation the law of definite proportions. Remember, a law in science is something that we observe again and again, but we don't have any explanation for it. He then noticed that if he took another hydrogen-oxygen compound and split it into its components, he would get a different ratio, and that this ratio would be a multiple of the previous ratio, a whole number multiple. He called this general observation the law of multiple proportions. The two proportions would be whole number multiples of each other. This seems really obvious to us now because we know about these chemical formulas and we can see right there there's twice as much hydrogen as oxygen. But Dalton didn't have these chemical formulas. In essence, what he figured out was that these chemical formulas must exist. And he decided that atoms are little particles of elements that combine to make molecules of compounds. A bit later, a guy named J.J. Thompson was investigating electricity and he discovered the electron. Let's check out this video. Uh, you okay? Okay. Okay, and you notice? Wow, electrons are moving in the electricity in this cathode ray tube, and they actually make that little wheel spin around. So J.J. Thompson deduced that there must be little negative particles in electricity, and he called them the electron. This led to the plum pudding model. This is the plum pudding model. It has a positive background material for the atom and negative electrons embedded in it. This is an actual plum pudding. It's got a bread pudding background to it and plums embedded in it. You can see the resemblance. This spotted dick is another British dessert, which was probably a contender for the model name. Luckily, they didn't pick it. It would have been so embarrassing. The next guy to come along and do some science that led to a evolution of the atomic model was Rutherford. He shot some alpha particles at some gold foil, and most of the alpha particles went straight through. Some of them bounced off. This led to the nuclear model. Rutherford deduced that most of the atoms must be empty space. The alpha particles were going straight through. But there were some chunky nuggets in there that made the alpha particles bounce off. That's the nucleus, where most of the mass is. So this is the nuclear model. The protons and the neutrons are in the nucleus. The electrons are out here, and there's a whole bunch of empty space out here. The next bit of evidence that really changed the atomic model was the line spectrum. If you take white light from the sun or some other hot white source and you pass it through prism or diffraction grating, you get this continuous spectrum. The white light is split up into its various colors. It makes a rainbow. But if you take light that's produced by a single gas atom being excited, for instance, if I have a tube full of helium and I run electricity through it, and there's nothing in there but helium, I'm not going to get white light, and I'm not going to get a continuous spectrum. I'm just going to get a few little colors appearing. They're in the right spot. This blue is where it would have been in the rainbow. This red is where it would have been in the rainbow. But I'm only going to get a few little colors. And people thought that this weirdness must be caused by the electrons in the atom, since it was electricity running through the atoms, and it was about the same energy level as electrons. And so they decided this line spectrum must mean this, that there are only certain energy levels allowed for the electrons that are around the nucleus. This led to the Bohr model, and in the Bohr model, the electrons are only allowed at certain orbits. The lower energy electrons are orbiting lower, and the higher energy electrons with a higher velocity can be further away from the nucleus. They have enough energy to pull away from those positive charges. And in this model, only certain energy levels are allowed. The electrons can never be in between the orbits. In later quantum models, people decided that the electrons weren't orbiting around there. 
but that they did have definite energy levels. And because this model was following the Bohr model, they decided to call those energy level orbitals rather than orbits, as Bohr had done. But they really have nothing to do with orbiting. It's a little bit confusing, but we're stuck with this term. And what people decided must be going on in order for the electron to poof from one energy level to another, it had to act like a wave rather than a particle. But then sometimes, like when the electrons hit that little spinny wheel we just saw in that video, it acts just like a particle. <sighs> and this led to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, that the electron is both a wave and a particle until you look at it, and then it's one or the other. Oh, I'm sure you've heard of the Schrodinger's cat paradox, that the cat is both dead and alive until we open the box. It sounds crazy, and it's fun to argue about, but it is not really that important to us as chemists. All we really need to know is that there are only certain energy levels allowed. The lowest energy level is called the ground state. It's analogous to the ground. If I were to release a ping pong ball in this room, eventually it would sit on the ground. And the same is true for electrons. If you just leave them alone, eventually they're going to fall back down to the ground state, the lowest level. It's where they're at home. If you give them a little energy, they can get up to these excited states. The amount of energy that you have to give them is called a quantum of energy, or packet of energy, or it's sometimes called a photon of energy. Electrons have to absorb exactly the right amount of energy in order to go from one level to another. They can't absorb more, they can't absorb less. It's always going to be exactly this quantum of energy to become excited. Once they're excited, they have more energy. Woohoo! Eventually, though, when they're excited, they will drop back down to a lower energy level. When electrons drop back down, they're going to emit a quantum or photon of energy to move to the lower energy state. This is where we get the line spectrum from. Here's a picture of an atom with different energy levels for the electron. This n here is the principal quantum number. If you remember electron configurations, those things that go 1s, 2p, 3s, 3p, those things, the big numbers in the front, the 1 and the 1s, and the 2 and the 2p, and the 3 and the 3s, that's this number. It's like the main energy level. These energy levels tend to be closer together the further away from the nucleus you get. So to go from n equal 1 to n equal 2, that's a big change in energy. It's a big jump right there. But then to go from n equal 2 to n equal 3, it's a smaller jump. And n equal 3 to n equal 4, even smaller. And they'll just get smaller and smaller and smaller. There are a lot of energy levels, and there are a lot of transitions that we could measure. Different energies, different lines in the line spectrum. But only a few of them are ones that we can see that are in the visible light range. This is hydrogen, and these are its energy levels. And you can see that this series right here that's going from higher levels to n equals 2, this is the only one that produces visible light. This series, where it's going to n equals 1, is going to give us ultraviolet light. This one, going to n equals 3, is going to give us infrared light. We can't see this part of the line spectrum, but we can use some devices to measure them and learn some things about the atom. The energy given off or absorbed by electrons is in the form of electromagnetic radiation, which is a big fancy word for light. On this end of the electromagnetic spectrum, we have a tiny wavelength. And you can imagine if you're just standing still and these waves are going past you, because they're so tiny, a million waves are going to go past you every second. That's called the frequency of the wave. The frequency is given this funny letter, nu, and when we have a tiny wavelength, we're going to have a high frequency. Oddly enough, the energy of the wave is proportional to the frequency. So you might be thinking, oh, these tiny waves, they'll have tiny energy. You would be wrong, though. These tiny waves have got a high frequency, and that means they're going to have a high energy. On the other end of the spectrum, when we have these great big waves, they're going to go by not so quickly. One every now and then will go by. They have a lower frequency, 
and so they're going to have a lower energy. On this end, we have waves like radio waves, microwaves, they're low energy waves, and down here we have high energy rays, gamma rays, and x rays. For waves at a constant speed, lambda and nu, wavelength and frequency, are inversely proportional. So as the wavelength gets bigger, the frequency gets smaller. In fact, we can write an equation for it. Lambda times nu is equal to the speed. Look at the units. This is in meters. This is in per second. And then I'll have meters per second. Check out these units on frequency. Seconds to the negative one is usually how we write it because to say per second is sort of awkward. It's so awkward that a lot of times people call it something else entirely, the hertz. But it just means seconds to the negative one or per second. For electromagnetic waves or light, the speed is always going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It's constant. It's given the letter C because Einstein gave that letter to it. And you know, whatever Einstein says goes in science. This equation and this number are on your crib sheet. You don't need to memorize it. The other equation you're going to need to know is this one that relates the frequency to the energy. This constant here, proportionality, is called Planck's constant. These are the units on it, named after Max Planck. There's this picture. It's got a cool name. This equation is also on your crib sheet. You don't need to memorize it, and so is the constant. So here's an example of a problem you might be asked to do. What's the wavelength of light given off when the hydrogen electron goes from a 2p to a 1s orbital? The energy of the photon of light is 1.634 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. When they give you the energy like this, it's for a single electron. If they say it's for a mole of electrons, it's going to be much bigger. Or uh, if they want to know how much energy will be given off by a mole of electrons doing this, you would have to multiply it by 6 times 10 to the 23rd. Go ahead and try this one and go on when you're ready. I'm going to start with this equation since I've been given the energy and from this equation I can solve for the frequency. Watch your units here. They should be working out just fine. Be careful punching these numbers into your calculator. Make sure you're using the EE key and not trying to put in times 10 and caret. It'll give you the wrong answer. So here's my answer in hertz or seconds to the negative one. The other thing they asked for was the wavelength. So I'm going to take my equation that says C equals lambda times nu and rearrange it a little bit. And I'm going to get my wavelength, and this is in meters. We hardly ever hear about the frequency of light in meters. They usually report it in nanometers. So I'm going to switch it to nanometers right here. Be careful. Remember when you're multiplying by 10 to the 9th, this is 1 EE9, not 10 EE9. These orbital energy levels are going to vary from atom to atom depending on the size of the nucleus. If I have a bigger positive nucleus, it's going to pull all the electrons in further, and it's going to be harder and harder to move an electron from a lower energy state to a higher energy state. So the delta E is going to be bigger when I have a bigger nucleus. So if I wanted to pull an electron from here to here for hydrogen, it would take a certain amount of energy, and it would take more energy if it was helium. Not twice as much, but more. 